Bit like a TEDx talk on its own. So some travel deep and some travel wide. I, in boats many, decided to sail the latter tide. Then as you've set some really high bars. I mean, thank you, it was a graveyard shift and you've really woken up everyone. And now, after that, I do not know how to match up to that energy. I've always been behind the camera. It was very easy for me to, you know, tell people like Tanaz, SNA, thoda aur emotion, thoda sa aur feeling, andar se, andar se. And you know, it was damn simple, because you're like, haan kar lega na, that's what they're supposed to do. But damn, when you stand in front of one, two, three cameras, a huge set of audience, two glaring lights into your eyes, Ouch! It hurts. It's tough. So I'm not a man of words, as uh, my dear friend had spoken, that I have delved into many mediums, but um, words has always been, or have always been, my weakest, uh, I would say, medium of expression. Uh, the year was 2009-2010, pre-intense year. I lost my mother, my grandfather and my grandmother in a span of two months. I was really, really close to my mother. I, my entire purpose of life was actually kind of fixated to my mother because if it wasn't for her, why would I even work hard? Because, you know, that's how I had grown up. I was a mama's boy. Like how you have in Parsis, I think mean, almost every third, rather every boy. Uh, so, no, 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 no. Don't get me wrong, we have to be politically correct. Uh, take back these, edit them out. I didn't mention Parsi and I didn't mention Mama Boy, but I was one. When my mom passed away, I had no clue as to why am I doing what I'm doing? Because every time I won an award or if I did something in life, I would give her a call and her joy would make me feel like ah, it was worth it. Otherwise, I don't know. But anyway, there was too much of trauma that happened and my, my easiest way of dealing with the trauma was bhavo, as Nena had put. And I had bhavoed into work. I loved my work, so I really, really drowned myself into shooting. And I would say it was a blessing in disguise. It was also the year where actually it was the prime of my advertising career. I was shooting over five to six films every month. There was barely a few hours a week that I would come back home. I would be either at the shooting floors or at the edit studio, but really working hard. When the lull came around the mid of May 2010, I figured out that I needed to drown my sorrows further. If it's not work, I drowned myself into parties. So there was a party that I was throwing every second day. There was enough of getting wasted, getting other people wasted, same conversation, same food. And after some eight or ten parties, I was like, I'm not happening either. You know, it's getting kind of repetitive. Anyway, the story is not about all that I've spoken till now. You can kind of erase this in your edits. The story is about that one 3 a.m. Uh, in the year, in the month of May, uh, mid-May around 2010, when I was wrapping up all the, uh, uh, you know, the byproducts of a really, really debaucherous party, and I was putting things into the kitchen, it was around that time uh, when I realized that I, I can't continue with these same conversations anymore. I have another project which is starting in another 10 days. Let me just get out. Let me travel. I've not taken a vacation since the year 2000. I mean, by, I mean, the last time I've taken one was 2000. I'd gone to Diu when I had just started seeing a girl. And that was it. I had not taken a vacation. So it was pretty well deserved. I've done pretty well. I've shot a lot of commercials, made a lot of money. I should just blow it up. So I shut my eyes and said, where do you want to go? I said, somewhere cold. It's month of May. I don't want to be in this country. Okay, place which doesn't take your visa, Bhutan. So I said, done. Within the next uh, two hours, I planned my trip. I was kind, kind of a, pretty much of a plan. I believe I own the destiny. If I did not make it, nobody else would. I am the author of my book. I'm not the character of my book. I'm all of that. I, I kind of had that entire sense of entitlement, empowerment, all of it. So I said, okay, we need to know what we are doing. Bhutan had a cash economy, no car economy, get the monies out, called up a few people, got lots of cash in, all sorted. I'm going to stay in the best of the hotels, take the flight, and da, 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 da. everything all figured out. It's a very good 
7.30 flight to Bangdobra, I was at the airport, I had packed a huge suitcase, now, I hadn't traveled right from to the year 2000, so my suitcase was, all, was not like a backpacker, it's a massive one, it had three blazers, by the way, for, for a trip of seven days or eight days, packed a huge uh, camera lens kit with all the lenses, laptop bag in case if I'm expected to write a treatment note and send it, all of that, and here I was ready to go for a seven day trip to Bhutan. The plane lands in Bagdobra. I walk up to the taxi counter and I say, could you please give me a cab to Funshali, which is the border of uh, Bengal and Bhutan. I said, uh, sorry sir, there is a Gurkha strike happening in Bengal. We do not have taxis flying for the next three to five days. I was like, what are you saying? I said, sir, you can go to Darjeeling. I said, Nini, I've been to Darjeeling. I've been to Kalimpong, I've been to Siliguri, I've been to all of these places. No, no, I have to go to Bhutan. So I said, yeah, but sir, there are no taxis. I said, how long is the drive? I said, it's a four and a half hours drive. Okay. No problem. I'll start walking. So I start walking with that massive. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, by the way. The, 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 the size of the suitcase was almost three and a half feet, four feet with a massive laptop bag. Those laptops were not as light as MacBook Air is today. It was a MacBook 17 inch, really big and really heavy. And the entire lens kit, 200mm, 70mm, 35mm, the sort of massive camera bag. I start walking. I don't ask me why, please. I'm just never ask me why because I still don't know what came on to me. They say, <laughs> Mata Raja thi hai, Mata Aage thi. <laughs> Meri Mata, sorry. So, uh, I start walking and after a few hundred meters, I see a cab coming. I say, Bhai, can you take me to Funchal? And he said, Sir, too much of uh, riots happening on the Tista River and the Torsha River. I said, Okay, take me up till there, if you don't mind. After that, I'll walk. At least I'll save some amount of trudgery, pain, whatever. He says, Done, done. If you don't mind, can you fill up the fuel? I said, Definitely. So I, we went to a fuel place, I paid for the fuel. Uh, we filled the car with the fuel and we started driving. I was lucky, the Tista River, we just flew without any kind of uh, blockages. But when we reached the Torsha River, which was approximately three hours, three and a half hours, or yeah, into the drive, I saw people burning buses, tires, not very major, little ones. I grew up in Calcutta, so trust me, it was by Calcutta standards. Very party, as a, as a bomb would say. So, uh, sorry, as a big body would say. I'm not politically correct, I'm not a politician, so please, please forgive me for all my politically wrong uh, innuendos. Uh, I hope this disclaimer works and I will not be uh, having memes around me for the next seven years of my life. But coming back, Torsha River. So there was these things happening and the driver said, uh, sir, if you don't mind, can you spend some time here and maybe this will kind of fade out. So I saw a man at the Torsha River fishing. I said, hey, okay, I'll go there. We'll, I'll learn how to fish. I've never fished in my life. So I went down. We uh, did some fishing. We caught a really beautiful big katla fish. We cooked it together and I ate. While we were eating, this gentleman, the driver comes down and he says, oh, I don't think this is going to work. You'll get down here only. I said, no problem. How far is the border? He said, some 20, 25 kilometers. Oh, that's wonderful. How much will it take me? Two, three hours? He said, yeah, you should be there in two, three hours. I said, very good. Thank you so much. He drops my luggage and I start walking. There was a Kali temple. I bow down to the Kali temple, to the goddess. And I said, give me all the power to walk through, the, through this mess. And actually nothing happened. I kind of quietly walked through that bridge. Uh, none of it, nobody really even bothered looking at me. It was like, okay, this guy doesn't belong to the world that we need to protest, so let him go. I walked through the tea estates, beautiful tea estates. I could have never imagined going through them. Obviously, scary because you're wondering if there might be a, a tiger, panther, leopard, snake, other creepy trolley which might just come up. But, anyways, none of that happened. And by the time it was 7 30 in the evening, 7 38, I reached the border and I tell myself, yay, I made it. What a beautiful feeling of achievement. So I asked, which is the most expensive hotel in Funchaling? And someone pointed it out and said, sir, Funchaling International. I said, okay. 
I walk in, I walk to them and I say, which is your most expensive room? They said, sir, uh, we have a room which is for 3,500. I said, done. And I go for my man pouch where I was carrying all the cash. By the way, Bhutan is a 100% cash economy there. You couldn't use any of your plastic cards or any kind of apps at that point. This is 2010. So I go for my cash in my man pouch, which I was carrying a lot of cash, and I find nothing. All gone. Like, whoa, whoa, what happened? So I started scrambling around looking maybe I kept it somewhere. And then I remembered, oh, I took out the money from this pouch and gave it for the petrol. I left that pouch in the car when I went to catch that katla. Oh my god, it's got stolen. So I was like, okay, which is the cheapest hotel now? <laughs> I went for my wallet. I had some 3,000, 3,500 around that kind of amount in my pocket. So I said, Chalo, no problem. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to give a call to my relationship manager. I used to run a production house. Obviously, we used to deal with a lot of money. My, my, my RM doesn't want to lose me as a client, so I could kind of bully him to get me what I want. Until then, cheapest hotel. So cheapest hotel happened, it was it rained all night, beautiful, like it's a lot of photography in the morning. And I gave a call to my RM, Mr. Prashant Tripathi. Tripathi sahab, uh, I have to pay for money, you can do anything from any way, give me 50,000 rupees for 50,000 He said, sir, we don't have any relationship. I said, I don't care, you lose me as a, the arrogance, yeah? I could make anything happen. So I said, I don't care, get it done. Else you lose me as your client. He said, sir, don't worry. In the next 12 hours, I will make sure that somehow the money comes to the Royal Bank of Bhutan. I said, okay, in the meantime, I will reach Thimbu. How? I don't know, but I will. So, uh, I go, I take the visa. Out of the 3,500, 1,500 is gone for the visa. fees, And then I ask, will there be a bus leaving? Because obviously, I can't afford a car anymore. Will there be a bus leaving for Thimbu? And they said, um... Sorry, there was, but, uh, there was rain all night, so we have landslides, landslides, and therefore there is not going to be any bus going up to Thimbu. So I said, okay, if I could come from Bagdora to Punchaling, why can't I walk down from Punchaling to Thimbu? Simple, right? So I start walking. <laughs> with that massive three and a half feet bag, with that massive 17 inch laptop with all its accessories, with my DSLR, with the entire lens kit, I start walking up the hill. God alone knows, don't ask me why, but I do. Soon after a kilometer or a kilometer and a half, I reached the army cantonment area. Sir, uh, what is happening? Is there any truck, bus available that can take me to Thimpu? When do you think this landslide is going to be cleared? So they figured out with my voice that I belong to some place called Bombay and Bollywood industry ke saath kuch hai rishta, and that was it. My Bollywood stories, gossips, and some hidden stories, and they became my best friend. They said, we are the ones who are going to be clearing the entire set of those uh, landslides. So don't worry, you can come with us. We will take you, and then the landslide is up to the Langru, which is around 15-20 kilometers from Thimpu, and we'll drop you there. So it's done. Maggi khate khate, and uh, Bollywood's ke gossip karte karte, we reach Langru, and along with them, removing the debris, at 12, 12.30 in the night, they dropped me at Langur. So I said, okay, again, three and a half feet back, the laptop, the camera, I get down and I start walking. Now, this was not as simple as a walk, you know, in the plains, which was between Porsha to Kunshu. This was a nice mountainous trek. But somehow, managed to reach Timbu at 4.30 in the morning. It was cold, I sat there, and I was still wondering and asking myself as to why did I not turn back? Just go back. It was just a simple way. I would have just gone back, found an ATM, come back again. Or if not an ATM, because ATM would have also a limited amount of 15,000 to be taken out. I would have just gone to some other place. It was jinxed from the very beginning. So all of that kind of contemplation happening in the morning when I saw one gate of uh, a cafe, which is the only cafe in Thimpu called Ambian Cafe open. Two beautiful people called Leto and Juno standing right there and I asked them, Hi, can I get a cup of tea? My ego was so high that I couldn't tell them that, listen, I have no money to buy a cup of tea or I have no way to pay for it. But, you know, I was like scrounging the last bit of money that I had. I might as well just, you know, show off that I'm still some, somebody. 
that somebody is a very dangerous place to be. Sorry, I mean, you had mentioned about that nobody and somebody. I'd rather be nobody than be a somebody. <laughs> I mean, the kind of uh, Vata Pita type that I am. So, anyways, uh, I met uh, Juno and uh, this one, and I gave a call to my Aram, Tripathi ji. Tripathi ji, where is the money? Sorry, sir, we tried our best, no money coming. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. I'm already in Thimpu. I have my, my flight back in the next five days. How do you expect me to stay in like 1,000 rupees that I have in my pocket? Sorry, sir, we tried everything. I actually felt my knees quiver, like the way it is feeling right now. Worse, 10 times. I did not know clue what to do. So I asked, I mean, I narrated the story to Juno and uh, Leto. I expected Leto and Juno not to believe me. I think he's one more Indian con man. But thankfully, YouTube had some of my films and videos up, so it did not feel like that much of a con man. And they kind of agreed, okay, this could have happened. So I said, tell me something. Can I, I know how to cook. I'm a very good cook. I've been cooking from the age of six. I, uh, I know how to uh, play guitar. I know how to uh, tell stories. Can I do something for you guys that in return you can give me just one shelter and some food to eat for the next three days? They said, yeah, yeah, we do not have a lunch menu. We are a cafe. We've been trying to have a lunch menu. Can you help us make lunch? I can. Now, what was supposed to be a comfortable, luxurious vacation becomes a vacation where I actually am supposed to go to the morning markets. Pick up the vegetables, pick up the produce, come back, design the menu, make the menu, feed the people who come. Now, being the only cafe, it is a crowded cafe. It attracts all kinds of expats. So you can't just make puri aloo. You know, you have to make your food, you put your best foot forward because you're treating and you're, you're, you're kind of, you're catering to a clientele which is from across the world. But because I'm catering to the clientele from across the world, I get to meet some incredible people. These incredible people are exactly enamored by, really you walked? Really you did this? Really you had this journey? Hey, come on, let me have, I mean, let me know more about it. And they would get two more people to say, okay, look at this animal in the cage. We have some nice clown in the circus to show. Tell your story. So every time, like monkey, I would dance and I would tell the story and I'd get more people to come and hear my story. And it was good fun. By the end of it, I had learned Scottish dance. I was a jury at a graphic design institute. I went and uh, worked with a drug rehabilitation center where I was teaching them cooking or other life skills. And most importantly, I met this gentleman called Lama, which is Stephen Zampo. He, who had written money in books on Buddhism, used to conduct an evening session called Wisdom Tea. So I used to go along with him, sit down, and in front of him there would be an audience of at least 200, 300 people who would each talk about their pain, miseries, life issues, where the Lama would give them Gya. There was a time when a lady looked at me and she asked, she thought I was part of that with wise people. Little realizing how unwise I was, I had lots of vices though. And she asked, what do I do if I have pain? What do I do if I'm angry? I'm like, be angry man, pain is good, what's wrong with you? But anyway, that was me telling him, I had not thought about it, I just said it, right? But when I was coming back, I mean, so yeah, one more one more interesting anecdote. I used to go to that market every day to shop vegetables. On my way, before crossing the bridge, there was this beautiful market of silver jewelry. Now, I'm a huge fan of jewelry. I collect jewelry, wear jewelry, give jewelry. Like, I'm, I can spend my entire life just around jewelry because I do not know, it's one of my fetish. So silver, beautiful, oxidized silver jewelry. I'd go every day, take a picture, come back, show to my friends at the cafe. And I would, uh, uh, you know, tell them that I wish the only regret I have is I can't buy them. I, my regret of not going and checking out other places in Bhutan was not a regret. Because I'm really making amazing friends, having exciting experiences, doing so many things. I'm, I'm not even like, you know, touch the tip of the iceberg in terms of the experiences that I've had. So, uh, I would come and show it to them. So, when five days just flew by, and in that five days, a number of things which had happened. I had also uh, posed as a Bharatnatyam dance trainer and, you know, taught a set of expats how to do Bharatnatyam. Sorry, Asta, I do not know how to dance. 
and but it's not very really difficult to tell people who can't you know do a little bit of mudras and it works out and they would pay me for my alcohols or the parties at the end of it so they all got funded somehow or the other you may call me a con man by the end of it but anyways it happened but when in the when, when i was about to leave they threw me a uh, all of them put together threw me a beautiful farewell party 30 plus of them and each one of them gave me a gift and guess what was the gift each of those jewelry pieces that i showed them on the camera and i took picture of till date my friends till date i i uh chat with them they've come to my place they've hosted my dad my dad has traveled a number of times uh, to this place and i had a family an extended family which continued but most importantly what i had was i learned how to face my demons anyway this story which happened in 2010 i mean there can be a number of whatsapp me worthy gyan that i can come out with but one aspect which definitely changed the course of my life after that was uh, my understanding of pain and power pain you know in most of my learning in my life i was told that pain is a very negative thing in the axis linear axis there is a positive and there is a negative pain falls in the negative emotion i learned that pain is imperative in the order of nature there is no creation no transformation that can happen without pain pain precedes even childbirth like imagine childbirth without pain i i can imagine that I, I could be painless for me but i cannot imagine for any woman to give birth to a child and that's the ultimate creation pain i often believe is confused with the idea of suffering pain may be struggle but it's definitely not suffering when do we suffer we suffer when our needs and our wants are not in sync the universe pain is pretty purposeful if you realize because the universe actually gives you pain when you it wants your your alignment of your needs and wants to happen when your needs and wants are aligned you actually flow with the entire power of the universe you get to harness the entire power of the universe not just the universe the entire collective consciousness and the entire collective unconsciousness that is available across imagine how can i alone be more powerful than the entire collective power of the universe and if i can harness the entire collective power of the universe that is true power not the illusionary one that i used to believe that you should feed my ego i am the decider of my destiny i am the master of the universe he man no that was my biggest learning the fact that i i began to nurture pain not the other way around i did not nurture power i was nurturing pain i brought brought myself back to what do i really need which began a very painful journey because it was a journey of transformation from i believe i can do everything to i believe i need to know who i am what do i need not what do i want because my wants are symbiotic with my conditioning my needs are symbiotic with who i am my dna my 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 genetics my biology my psychology everything put together when we nurture pain we know that we are in the process of creating something beautiful something very meaningful and something very powerful thank you guys thank you ladies and gentlemen have a lovely